Hello, it's Monday the 12th of May. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast here on Arirang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. President Park Geun-hye will make an announcement on the Sewol Ho ferry sinking and ways to improve the country's safety regulations. Search efforts at the accident site are hampered by poor weather conditions. Samsung Group is on alert after the chairman of Samsung Electronics, Egon Yee, suffers a heart attack. He is recovering from emergency surgery at a hospital in southern Seoul. Plus, polls close in eastern Ukraine where calls for secession from Kiev were put to a vote. Pro-Russian rebels claim almost 90% of voters support sovereignty for eastern Ukraine. We start with the latest on the Sewol Ho ferry disaster. President Park Geun-hye will soon make a public statement on the tragedy. This was decided at a hastily arranged closed-door meeting with her senior secretaries on Sunday. The th roughly three-hour meeting took the form of a debate instead of a briefing in order to gather various opinions on how to make the nation safer, safer amid the ongoing uproar about the government's handling of the disaster. Presidential spokesperson Min kyung uk said the meeting focused on how to enhance the country's safety system. A specific date for the president's announcement has not been mentioned, but it's likely to come soon as Friday will mark one month since the sinking. Now, it was a tough and often frustrating weekend for the search teams and divers at the accident site as poor weather conditions limited what they were able to do, really. Our Kim ji reports on this and the deepening investigation into the sinking. Search efforts on the sunken Serhol ferry have once again been hampered due to poor weather conditions. A heavy wind watch was issued on Sunday morning and waters off of Korea's southwestern coast, which includes the accident site. It's the latest setback for divers tasked with searching inside the ferry, who have been kept out of the water since the wee hours of Saturday morning. In their place, around 20 submarine ships using sonar radars are conducting most of the searches, looking for bodies that may have been swept out of the ferry. One of the flowing buoys set up by authorities to track currents in the area was found as far away as 35 kilometers away from the ferry site. Prime Minister Chung Won visited the ferry site on Sunday afternoon. He vowed to provide special aid to the residents of Chindo Island who have helped with the search and rescue efforts at the expense of their own livelihoods. Investigations into the ferry sinking also continue. Prosecutors have arrested a senior official of an inspection company on charges of negligence. They say the inspector provided a false report on the condition of the ferry's lifeboats. The official in question submitted a report to the Korean Register of Shipping, saying that equipment in 17 categories on the Serhol ferry was in good condition. But only one out of 44 lifeboats deployed when the ferry began listing. Prosecutors are also zeroing in on the de facto owner of the ferry operator, Yu byung -on, and his family to determine whether there were any business irregularities that could have led to the ferry sinking. Yu's brother appeared for questioning on Sunday. He was paid monthly expenses of more than 2,000 U.S. dollars in business consultation fees by Chongyijin Marine Company, the operator of the Sewer Home. It represents the first time a family member of Yu's has shown up for questioning. Yu's eldest son has been summoned to appear on Monday. Kim ji Arirang News. Now, Korea's two main political parties have agreed to convene an extraordinary parliamentary session to discuss follow-up measures to the Sewol Ho ferry sinking. Floor leaders Lee Wang-gu of the ruling Senuri Party and Park yong san of the New Politics Alliance for Democracy say they'll open a plenary session and activate standing committees this week. The parties, however, disagree on uh, other matters surrounding the issue. Opposition lawmakers want a parliamentary probe and a special prosecutor to be appointed for the investigation. The ruling party has expressed reservations about both those requests. Now, in the rest of the day's news, North Korea will top the agenda when the defense ministers of South Korea, the US and Japan 
sit down for trilateral talks this month on the sidelines of an international summit. It's just one of several meetings South Korean Defense Minister Kim Gwan Jin is expected to hold at the Asia Security Summit in Singapore that begins on May 30th. Minister Kim is also expected to hold bilateral talks with his American and Chinese counterparts. Talks with the U.S. will center on a possible delay in the transfer of wartime operational control from Washington to Seoul. A possible North Korean nuclear test will make up the bulk of talks with China. Seoul says it has no plans for a separate meeting with Tokyo due to the historical and territorial disputes that have seen bilateral relations tumble to their lowest point in years. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un made a dramatic entrance at an Air Force event in North Korea over the weekend. He and his wife, Lee sol ju arrived in North Korea's version of Air Force One, a white jet complete with a, a big red star on the tail and a red carpeted in interior, and the jet itself is believed to be Russian-made. It's the first time Kim's personal plane has been seen in public, and fighter pilots were also given the chance to put their skills to the test, dropping bombs and competing for a trophy. Experts say Kim shift in focus from the army to the uh, army, from the army and the navy to the air force could be an indication that a provocation is in the works. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia, and beyond. On air, on your mobile, and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion euros. Now, Korea's richest man and Samsung Electronics chairman Lee Gan Hee is stable and recovering at a private hospital in southern Seoul after suffering a heart attack. Lee's health complications has Samsung Group on high alert. Our Kim Min Ji reports. The failing health of Lee Gan Hee, the chairman of Samsung Electronics, has yet again emerged as a massive concern to the management of the sprawling Samsung Group. He underwent an emergency medical procedure at the Samsung Medical Center on Sunday after suffering cardiac arrest. Hospital officials say the 72-year-old is stable and showing signs of improvement. The chairman showed symptoms of heart failure and underwent an emergency procedure which involved a stent placement. He's now in a stable condition and recovering. Samsung's top executives, including officials from the group's corporate strategy office, visited the hospital and held meetings to discuss the next steps. Experts speculate Samsung will not take any immediate action, but they'll keep a close eye on the situation for the time being. In 2008, when he gave up his position as Samsung Group chairman after a special inquiry which found him guilty of tax evasion and breach of duty, the group implemented several management reforms but did not enter an emergency business management mode. He returned to the front lines of management in March 2010. His ailing health, however, will likely have a substantial effect on the group's management as he makes key management decisions and initiates business reshuffles. The group recently underwent a major shakeup, transferring executives from the corporate strategy office to Samsung Electronics. The company is expected to take some special steps to carry out the so called Mac management put forward by E. Mac management refers to making fundamental changes to the firm in order to maintain its position as a top global corporation. The chairman has a history of respiratory problems dating back to the late 1990s when he had surgery for lung cancer. He was also hospitalized last summer with symptoms of light pneumonia. With E's health problems taking a turn for the worst, Samsung is also expected to accelerate its corporate succession to E's three children. E's only son, Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman E Jae-yong, will likely succeed him eventually. Kim min ji Arirang News. The prolonged economic slowdown we've been seeing here in Korea has pushed many local consumers to buy bigger and in bulk when they go to the supermarket. Sales of king-size products and multi-packs have exploded in the past four months alone, Pauli reports. From food and cosmetics to even consumer electronics, big box retailers are bumping up the size of their goods to attract customers. And it appears to be working. 
Large supermarket chains reported double-digit sales growth of bulk or larger packaged goods in the first quarter. Sales of large size products and similar goods increased 13.9 percent this year between January and April compared to the same period last year. Retailers say overall sales have been driven by growing demand for these larger products. Convenience stores have also jumped on board. Sales of higher volume milk products among major convenience store chains in Korea increased between 30 and 80 percent in just a span of six months. Since you get more for your money, these larger sized essential household products seem to be popular. Market analysts say the rising popularity of these products comes as customers seek to further stretch their budgets amid the prolonged slump in the economy. Meanwhile, companies are taking note and adjusting their offerings to meet the needs of value conscious consumers. Paul Yi, Arirang News. Three of the nation's leading credit card firms will be fully back to work by the end of the week as a three-month business suspension slapped on them for their involvement in the biggest personal data leak in Korean history is set to come to an end. The Financial Supervisory Service and the Financial Services Commission have punished KB Gungmin Card, NH Nonghyop Card and Lotte Card for neglecting their duties to prevent the leak of customers' information and to comply with internal controls. The three-month suspension during which they were banned from issuing new credit cards was the harshest penalty the firms could have received. It's believed to have cost the companies tens of millions of dollars and millions of customers. Now, when it comes to using credit cards, it seems most Koreans can't go a day or two without swiping their plastic. Among 18 countries recently surveyed by the Korea Financial Telecommunications and Clearings Institute, Korea came out on top in terms of credit card usage. The results showed the average Korean consumer made around 150 purchases using their credit card in 2012. Canada was far behind in second place at almost 90 purchases a year and the US third at 83. The total credit card spending of Koreans ranked third in 2012 with each consumer on average spending over eight and a half thousand US dollars. A team of local researchers say they have come up with a way of generating electricity from just raindrops that fall against a window or a roof. Our Sun Jung-in has this report. A piece of glass substrate is connected to a small LED light bulb. When droplets of water fall one drop at a time onto the substrate, the bulb gives off a pale light. With the indoor lighting turned off, the flashing light, resembling that of a firefly, can be seen more easily. This time, the researchers use a shower faucet to sprinkle water onto the glass substrate. The bulb emits an even brighter light. The secret is a new advanced energy device that turns moving droplets into electric power. It alters the electrical characteristic of water drops, which makes the electrons inside move suddenly, generating electricity. Water that is normally neutral instantly becomes positively charged due to the device, which causes electrons to move. One single drop of water can create up to 0.42 milliwatts, which can light three to four LED bulbs at the same time. Researchers say the technology can be applicable to our daily lives. Using water that is wasted in kitchen or bathroom sinks could bring about a new assessment of the true value of water, literally making every drop count. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Monday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, standing by, as always, at the news centre. Good morning to you, Eunice. Now, separatists in East Ukraine have pushed forward. They pushed forward with their, their vote on Sunday, and it seems the preliminary results are already out. Indeed, Mark, the preliminary vote count was announced just two hours after the polls closed in that referendum for self-rule. And no big surprises here. Pro-Moscow separatists say residents overwhelmingly supported their cause. Kwon so reports. It was the outcome everyone expected, but it's one that will face resistance from many inside and outside of Ukraine. 
The referendum vote on self-rule in two of the tensest regions in eastern Ukraine closed Sunday night local time. Preliminary results show nearly 90 percent in favor of self-governance in the region of Donetsk. Voter turnout there was around 75 percent. Early counts in Luhansk show about 80 percent in favor of self-rule. When I saw that the interim government had taken such illegal actions toward us, I decided to vote for myself. People in Kiev, however, are furious and are calling for national unity. This is not a referendum, but a lie. It's absolute Russia's provocation. Russia just wants to copy the script of Crimea's independence and separate Donetsk and Luhansk from Ukraine. At least one person was shot dead west of Donetsk city as armed men supporting the Kiev government tried to stop the vote. The final results will be announced on Monday. The legitimacy of the vote has been called into question, not only because it was held among a minority of the Ukrainian population, but also because people were seen voting more than once, while some areas didn't even have voting booths in place. The U.S. and the European Union say they won't accept the outcome, condemning the vote as illegal. The interim government in Kiev has called the ballot self-destructive and says the focus should be on the nationwide election set for May 25th. Western leaders agreed that if that vote does not take place, there will be consequences, including stronger sanctions against Russia. Kwon Suwa, Arirang News. Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan is coming under fire for his government's belated response to desperate parents' pleas to find their abducted school-age girls. Parents believe their daughters were sitting in one place for, quote, a good 11 days since their kidnap from Chibok Government Girls Secondary School. The Associated Press reports the Nigerian government declined initial offers of international help for some three weeks, a charge its presidential office has denied. And as international support teams began to arrive in the African country, British Prime Minister David Cameron became the latest high-profile supporter of the social media campaign to bring global awareness to the girls' plight. This as U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel told a U.S. broadcaster the search would be a difficult one in the vast African state. He added he had no plans at this point to put America troops on the ground. And political unrest is growing in Thailand following the ouster of its Prime Minister Yingluck Chinawat last week. Its caretaker government says it will step up security as opposition groups have issued an ultimatum for a new leader to be appointed by this Monday. They threatened a coup of remaining government officials otherwise. This as pro-government factions are calling last week's ruling by Thailand's constitutional court that found Chinawat guilty of nepotism. A Quote, judicial coup. And recovery teams searched the waters off of Libya on Sunday for bodies of the dozens feared dead in a boat that capsized carrying illegal migrants headed for Europe. The Libyan Interior Ministry says at least 40 people died in that vessel that carried 130. Some 52 were rescued. A Navy spokesperson said he believed the bottom of the small boat had collapsed due to the weight of the people on board. More than 100 people are believed to have died trying to cross the Mediterranean into Europe in the past two weeks alone. On Saturday, Libya had strongly urged the European Union to do more to curb the flow of illegal migrants making the sea voyage through its waters. And a good Monday morning to you all as we kick things off with the South Korean national football team as the Taeguk Warriors are set to begin their training for the upcoming World Cup today. With the team hoping to advance to the quarterfinals for the first time overseas, nine out of the 23 players on the roster will be at the Panshu National Training Center to begin their training. Of the nine players, Park Ju Young and Ki Song Young are currently rehabbing in preparations for the World Cup, and the rest of the team will join the group depending on their club team schedule. And the team will be training before starting their overseas training in Miami at the end of the month. And moving over to the IAAF World Challenge currently taking place in Tokyo, Japan, where the South Korean women's 400-meter relay team set a new Korean record on Sunday. 
The 400-meter women's relay team, which consists of Oh Soo Kyung, Lee Sun Hye, Jung Han Sor, and Park So Yeon, uh, finished with a final time of 45.32 seconds, beating a five-year-old Korean record by one one-hundredth of a second. Of course, despite the record finish, they managed to finish fourth place behind Japan, Australia, and the United States. And now with that, moving over to Sunday's KBO action. And despite rain in the forecast, all four games did take place as the Kia Tigers beat the Hanwha Eagles 5-2. Nexon heroes all over the LG Twins 8-1 thanks to Kang Jong hos Grand Slam and NC crushes Lotte 10-1. You want to take a look at the Tucson Bears try to win their series against the Samsung Lions. Of course, going into the game, here we go over to the first inning. Jorge Cantu sends one to deep left field. This one far enough to score OJ1 from third, and it's 1 0 Tucson. Next batter with a man on Hong Sung Un drills this one to deep left field, and there it goes. Gone a two run shot, and the Tucson Bears have an early 3 0 lead. Third inning, man on first, hip hip Jorge, Jorge Cantu with an opposite field shot, and it's 5 0 Tucson. Meanwhile, Tucson's Chris Volstead absolutely lights out in this game, goes eight and a third, giving up just three hits on one run while striking out three batters. As the Tucson Bears win the series with an eight to one win on another brilliant performance from Chris Volstead. And now moving over to some Sunday's K League Classic action. We had one match take place as the Ulsan Hyundai Tigers look to finally get a win, and this time against the Busan I Park. So let's take a look at the highlights from Ulsan's Bunsu Stadium. Of course, Ulsan trying to break out of a huge slump in this match, and in just the 10th minute of the match, it's going to be Kim Yong Tae here on the corner who sends one past the goalkeeper, and it's 1 0 Ulsan. Stays that way until going into the second half. And in the 61st minute, more from Ursan. This time, Anjin Bum finding the back of the net, and it's now 2 0. We're going to fast forward over to the 74th minute. This time, Han Sang Un has a chance, and he converts the third Ursan goal. And that's your final score as Ursan beats Pusan 3 0. Your final score. And more football this time over in the English Premier League, where Manchester City was one point away from claiming their second league title in three years. And after a 2 0 win over West Ham, they did just that. And while Liverpool looked to have the title in their hand just a few weeks back, an epic collapse leads to Manchester City claiming their second league title in three years in front of their home crowd at Ithiot Stadium. Man City would claim the title with two points ahead of Liverpool, while Chelsea finishes third with 82 points this season. And now finishing things off in the NFL as history was made over the weekend when the St. Louis Rams selected defensive lineman Michael Sam with the 249th pick overall. The Missouri All-American who came out last front, uh, February during an interview with ESPN was drafted on the final day of the NFL draft, becoming the first openly gay NFL player. The 24-year-old who thanked the St. Louis Rams for the opportunity and the city of St. Louis as well will be receiving the Arthur Ashe Courage Award at the SB in July as well. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Here in Seoul, we've received about 33 millimeters of rain overnight, which is quite a lot of rain to be seen in spring in the capital. But it's completely let up now, and sky should turn much brighter as we head into the afternoon. And temperatures will stay on the warm side for most areas. But here in the capital, we'll only get to see a high of 20 degrees Celsius, which is a tad lower than yesterday. So it will 
feel a bit breezy this afternoon, but temperatures will rebound into the mid-20s tomorrow, and it's likely to stay on the warm side until the end of the week. But please do notice the big temperature difference between lows and highs and dress accordingly. And as for the weather conditions over in Jindo, winds and waves will continue to be rough, with winds blowing in at 7 to 16 meters per second, and waves will be tough. So overall, poor conditions are expected. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The high in Seoul will rise to 20, while Daegu peak at 27, Gwangju and Busan climb to 25 and 24 respectively. For other regions, it looks like down on Jeju and Daejeon will reach 21 and 22 later in the day. Dokdo should see a high of 19, while Mount Kungang tops out at 16. Well, that's all for now, but I'll be back with more updates afternoon. Thank you very much, Gion, for the weather there. And that's all we have for you for now, but we'll be back at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.